So we're here today in Berlin at the third annual plenary of, of INET with the team that is running the program in Imperfect Knowledge Economics. Um, we've given them a grant, Advancing Imperfect Knowledge Economics, and there are four of them. Roman Friedman, uh, Michael Goldberg, Katerina Juselius, and Soren Johansson. Um, but uh, let me start with, with you, Roman. Um, welcome. Thank you. Great to be here. I'm trying to, I've been reading your proposal for this. What's really quite uh, stunning to me, you're attempting to do what I would have thought in my training is not possible, okay, to model the unmodelable. Economists, as you say, are used to using fully determined models and just adding noise and, and running regressions and so forth, but you're really taking seriously the notion that the world is, is, is full of moments of non-routine change and, 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 and instabilities and so forth. And you're actually not doing history, you're trying to do quantitative methods attached to this. Have I got that right? You got that right. Whether we'll succeed in this, we'll see. We hope that the non-routine change doesn't happen that frequently, because if it does happen that frequently and there are no even qualitative or contingent regularities, then of course we can't do the formal theory. Mm -hmm. We did find that in asset markets, you can both do the theory and do econometrics and bring it to the data. Mm -hmm. So there's some hope, but uh, it's actually a crucial open question that we want to investigate to where the boundary, where the frontier actually is. Well, you, were, you had done this some work in this vein. This new project is building on the work that you did before um, with Michael Goldberg. That's where we started. Okay, tell Michael's me about PhD that. Michael's PhD thesis was an attempt to understand exchange rates, and it came from a very simple, he had a, he was- So Michael, he was your student? Right. Okay. He was perplexed by the idea that there were findings by very important people like Ken Rogoff, who argued that fundamentals do not matter for exchange rates, yet he, being a keen observer of markets, noticed that everybody looks at fundamentals. So there was a certain dissonance between people reading the Financial Times and what the economic theory was providing. So we really started with exchanges, and the exchange rate economics is actually a formal, the imperfect knowledge economics is actually a formal book. Beyond mechanical markets was an attempt to explore other markets to explore yes. a fish to explore a different way of thinking about market efficiency to explore a different way of thinking about the market and the state and variety of surroundings. But this started with this with this dissertation, Michael. And what, when did you finish this dissertation? I finished the dissertation yeah. in 1991. And you've continued to to work, and so your professor became your collaborator. Is that that's right? right? That's right. Before I started working with Roman, I was working with a fellow from. Uh, Vienna, his name is Stefan Schulmeister, who is really just a great empirical economist. And he was the one who introduced me to international macro and telling me that the models that I was learning in the classroom really had no connection to what was actually going on in the world. And he introduced me to traders at, at these banks. And I was in New York, so I, I met these traders, and these traders were. I was asking them this questions. Is, as a graduate student. As said. a graduate student, yes, yes. asking them, well, you know, how, how do you trade and what do you look at? And fundamentals were central. Uh, uh, technical trading was very important. And in the academic literature, uh, economists were concluding that fundamentals didn't matter at all. And I show up in uh, uh, Roman's office and he says, structural change. That's what's going on. Look at Maisie and Robo. So I picked up the paper, Amazing Rogoff, and they're comparing the predictions of these uh, exchange rate models, but assuming that you have a fixed model over 20, 30 years. And it doesn't make any sense to think that, well, you would think fundamentals might drive uh, people's forecasts, but you wouldn't think that they matter in exactly the same way over 20 or 30 years of data. So, and I had no idea what we would find, but I said, look, if we look back in time, uh, historical data, maybe we have a chance of detecting points where there were sort of major structural changes, and it was unbelievable. Fundamentals came in uh, significantly with the right signs, they beat the random walk at the six-month horizon, they got the right side of the market 100% of the time. Mm -hmm. But the only way to see that is to allow for fundamentals to matter in different in ways different during ways, different time periods. In different regimes. And so you wrote a number of papers together. That's right, with, with and, Roman. And that eventually were collected in this, in this book. 
and then you created a, a more popular version with some more more ideas. Um, but so, how did you then come to this whole project of advancing in perfect and, and adding another more to your team and and building out? It seems the empirical side of this much more and more asset markets and 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 so forth. How did that come to be? Through a non-routine change. Through non-routine change. Through non-routine change. In your life, change. in your person, in your in your. Right. Okay. We basically yes, came yes. to it through unexpected events that yes. no one could fully foresee. Yes. And, <laughs> such as. Such as that through uh, my wife, we early on met Saren, who my wife built on his work. Actually, is she's a mathematical statistician. Then through Saren, we met. So Saren, 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 you're talking Saren Johansson here, yeah. who is a statistician. Yeah. A mathematical statistician. And then it so happened that Saren got interested in econometrics and developed the CVAR theory that CVAR I means is, like is called integrated vector autoregressions, okay. which is the vector regressive models that Chris Sims had worked on, but taking into account the non stationarity very, very seriously and looking at this. And I actually taught from his lecture notes at NYU at the econometrics class before all of this. And then he and then Katarina can tell you how so then yes, that's so the tell next us, So tell us event. the next piece of this non-routine change. <laughs> Katarina, so how did you get into this picture now? Well, we, we actually had a habit of, of uh, having a dinner every uh, year together with, with Roman and his wife and and uh, yeah I think it it was in two thousand one when, um, you know, Roman speaks a lot. And, and at dinner, he spoke even more than usual. <laughs> and, and he was so enthusiastic about his, his new theory. And he spoke about uh, what it meant and the implications of it. And, and I could listen to him and I said to myself, I mean, I have all the, the evidence already. I've, I've done the, the empirical applications of it. And it all fits. So I, I realized that that was the theory I had been looking for for very long. And because you, you were an empirical, you were an econometrician, and you were looking for regularities in the data. Exactly. In this particular style, this general to specific. Tell me a little bit about this. Exactly. Because I, I, I take the, as a starting point, uh, there is one reality, I mean, measured uh, with the variables uh, we have <laughs> available. And there are a lot of, of, of economic models. And in a sense, they cannot all uh, uh, be, be relevant because they are sometimes they have conflicting uh, 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 implications and so on. So my idea is that uh, you use the, the co-integrated VAR model to structure the data in a, in a way, I think, which is very relevant, uh, 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 economically very relevant. And it means, uh, for example, we try to, to address, uh, say, the uh, what are the pulling forces? What are the things that bring you back to, to equilibrium? What are the, the forces that push you away from equilibrium? And most theory models say something about these uh, forces. And I try to, to, to extract the basic assumptions uh, regarding these pulling and pushing forces mm -hmm. and formulate them into uh, testable uh, assumptions on that model. And that is how I proceed. And then when I, I did it before I met uh, Roman, and the problem was that then I found features in the data that I, I said are absolutely inconsistent with, with, with standard models, because there are more persistence in, in the data than the models can explain. Mm -hmm. And that persistence, I realized when <laughs> Roman spoke about it, that is exactly what he talked about. <laughs> and hence, I also got very interested in it. In, in starting and so, so you've actually been collaborating for a while. Okay, so, uh, so what is new here? You're, you're expanding, you're having students involved, it's an international project. It's building on what you've done before, but now it's advancing in perfect knowledge economics. In, in a very serious questions remaining. Yeah. And they are both theoretical and empirical and econometric. The theoretical questions have to do with what is the scope of the middle ground between fully predetermined models and animal spirits, which as Ned Phelps had aptly put in his Wall Street Journal article, cannot be modeled. Mm -hmm. We try to see how large this space is. That depends on whether we can find qualitative and actually contingent, namely regularities that come into existence and disappear at moments in time that no one can specify, whether there's a sufficient duration of those qualitative regularities so you can actually 
do some data work. And then there are some very thorny econometric issues that we have begun to address in the new paper that we just put out. So there's a lot. Well, this is really, done. this is, this is, seems to me the agenda of a young man. So I hope you have some young people to, to help you and bring, <laughs> them, so too. And bring <laughs> them along. Um, but I'm also interested, and I'm noticing in your, in your CV, Roman, that you really began life as a physics and math person at, at Cooper Union in, in, in New York. Um, and then you continued on math and computer science. Um, so you haven't always been an economist. What, how important is this, this background that you have in, in, the, in, in physics and math and computer science for what you do now? You see, I come from a country where if I said that I would study economics, my father would commit suicide. And where is that? Poland. Yes. At the time I lived there, studying economics meant that one had to be a part of the apparatchiks, basically, and follow it. I was always interested in philosophy and economics, but real people can only study pure sciences, because that's what insulated you from the ideological pressure. So when I came to the United States, I studied physics, and that turned out to be very, very useful. Because the entry barrier and where economies derive most of the rents come from a mathematical training, and I came from the mathematical training. So for me, when, so I went straight to graduate school in economics after studying physics, and I didn't find it too difficult. And that's, that was the first clue that I had that there's something wrong with the field. <laughs> because, because it should be much more difficult for me, not knowing economic reality, to do as well as I did should not have happened. And yet it happened, and I knew that there was something about this field that, that, that was at variance. And then the key element was that Ned Phelps gave a So this is Ned Phelps at Columbia University right. you're talking about He here. gave a lecture yes. on macro, on the new field of Russia, the Russian expectations has arisen. And, that really rang the bells, and then we started to collaborate with Ned about trying to bring it down, then we lost the debate, and that was the beginning. So this work that you're proposing to do now all has its origins back then in these conversations with your professor, yeah. um, Ned Phelps. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, this is, this is quite an incredible uh, collection of people and a story. It seems, seems fated to be. And so we're, we're very pleased at INET to be able to support this and, and, and looking forward to um, seeing your results and hearing, hearing as, they, as they develop. And uh, you seem so enthusiastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.